G'day and welcome back. This is part two of the Amstrad joystick series. I'll be building an AutoFire adapter for the joystick. In the last video, I went through how to build this joystick for the Amstrad CPC-464. One thing that you'll notice quickly is that the directional buttons have an auto repeat feature built in. So if I hold the button down, left, right, down and up, it auto repeats. The fire command doesn't repeat, so if I hold the fire button down, I only get one fire only. I need to press it down multiple times to get that fire. So let's say there's a game that requires the fire button to be pressed multiple times. You've got to keep hammering that button down. Having an auto fire option for the joystick will just help when playing those games just a little bit easier. When I was looking to find a circuit to build for the auto fire, there wasn't a lot of options out there but they all had a similar design for them. They all used a 555 timer chip to oscillate the fire button and then just a simple connector to bypass the fire switch using a transistor instead of a, a finger to press the button. This circuit was quite good. It has a variable resistor which allows you to change the speed of the auto fire and a switch to turn it on and off. The components here, fairly straightforward, really easy to find. So I looked into ways of building this. I thought, well, I can just uh, design my own circuit board. But in the end, I thought, hey, why don't I just be original or ultra retro with this and build it exactly the same way that it's designed here, using a strip board and with the same components. When using a strip board, as we don't want all the strips to connect to each other, some of the holes need to be cut, all the traces need to be cut, and it shows you how to do that there. And also it has connecting holes that will make it easier to, for you to insert the component into the board in the right spot. So for instance, R1 here, the 2.2 resistor, 2.2K resistor, goes in holes A4 to A9. If we go up here, and we've got the resistor here and A4 to A9. It's quite standard to have a strip board laid out like this where you have A to Z across the top and num numeric numbers downwards. In this article, there is no circuit diagram. Now you just have to put the pieces in and assume that it will work. But let's have a look how this circuit actually works. And this is the auto fire circuit that is published. It uses a 555 chip in a stable mode. Now there are lots of videos on explaining how the a stable mode works on a 555 timer chip. In summary, this output pin oscillates between high voltage and zero voltage at a constant rate. And this rate is determined based on these two resistors, the 10K and the 15K. And in combination with this 15K in series, I have a variable resistor here, which can change between 0Ks and 100Ks. And also this capacitor down here plays a part to determine the frequency. So the 555 timer chip is set up. It comes out of the out pin here. I just send a bit of current down to an LED to show that the uh, circuit is working and how fast that it is oscillating at. And over here, just have a voltage divider into the transistor. Now I've set up a resistor and a LED as well just to show that current is flowing between the collector to the emitter when a little bit of current is on the base. This connection here between the collector and the emitter will be the, the fire pin, pin 6, to the ground pin, pin 8. With the variable resistor here, the 100k resistor about in the middle point, it's oscillating at about 10 hertz, which is 10 times a second. If I decrease the resistance, the oscillation will become much quicker and will oscillate at approximately 36 hertz, which is about 36 times a second. And if I increase the resistance, it oscillates at about 6 times a second or 6 hertz. This is just a simulation. I'll plug my multimeter onto the transistor here when I build it and we'll see what the actual frequency is. 
Okay, so here are all my components. I've got the LED, my transistor, the five resistors, I've got the electrolytic capacitor, the ceramic capacitor, I've got my 555 timer chip, I've got my on and off switch, I've got my variable resistor here, my trim pot, and I've got my, my male and female D9 connector for the joystick. I've also got the battery connector, some wire here, a box to put it in, and I've got this drill bit. And what the drill bit is for is for cutting the tracks on the strip board. As you can see, the tracks run horizontally, and I can cut them by using a knife, but it's much easier to get the drill bit into the hole and spin it around a bit to cut the tracks. So before I cut these tracks, I just want to mark the actual holes that I do need to cut. Now on the diagram, as you can see, there's the black components or the black parts, which are essentially the cut tracks. The black circles are the, the holes that are going to be used for the components and to be soldered, but the black strips or the black lines are the ones that I need to cut. So for the IC, if I read across, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight across and one up. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this one here, this one here, this one here, this one here. And then I need to cut uh, two more across. So it's five across from the right and one up again. So one, two, three, four, five, one up there and there. And then from that bit, you need to go two up and three across. One, two. One, two, three. And cut that track. Okay, I'm happy with uh, my markings, so I'm just now going to use the drill bit and twist it gently. You can see there, it's not 100% cut, just a bit more. And a bit more. Okay, that looks good. Let's test that out on a continuity tester on my multimeter. So I've got the left hand side here, the right hand side, no beeps over here. Yep, I'm getting beeps. So that has been cut now. Now I'm just going to do the rest of them. Okay, there's my strip board that has been cut. I've checked for continuity and there is no continuity between the cut holes, which is excellent. Now it's a matter of flipping it over and putting the components in here. All right, here is the mostly complete circuit. I have uh, put all the components in based on what the design is. I have uh, underneath here, I see the 555 chip, the resistors, I've got some wires here connecting, you know, the power leads and the ground leads together. I have my variable resistor and I have an on and off switch. I have raised them because I am going to insert this into a container and uh, that will be on the lid of the container. I also have the LED here and uh, the capacitors. I've also connected my 9 volt battery to it and you can see underneath here, a bit of the soldering, yeah, not pretty, but it works and it's fine. It's all connected. So if I turn it on, the LED here should uh, illuminate and change at the rate of this variable resistor. And based on the simulated example, it should r flash at a rate of approximately five to six times a second to about 30 times a second. All right, so let's turn this on and see if it is working. There you go, there it is flashing at the moment, probably about six times a second. I change the variable resistor. You can see that. Right, let's do it on this hand. Should be flashing faster and faster. And you can almost can't see it flashing there. I'll start slowing it down. And there you go.
All right, I have my multimeter set up in Hertz or frequency mode. If I place the positive against the collector and the negative against the base, and this is at the slowest speed, it looks like I'm getting consistently 5.7 or 5.8 Hertz. And if I increase the variable resistor to the fastest rate, and if I replace these probes, I'm getting 37.5 Hertz. So 37 times a second, it's flashing. And that's pretty close to the actual simulated version. Okay, next thing I need to do now is to plug the sockets in. How this works is that these sockets here, I'll just connect directly to each other. I can find the other one. Most of the pins just connect directly to each other. There they are. Uh, except for pin 6 and pin 8, they need to go either into one end of the uh, of the transistor and uh, so the pin 6 on the collector and pin 8 on the emitter. And just interestingly, looking at the schematic here, pin 6, which is the fire button, gets connected to each other just here. So under normal conditions, if the unit isn't on, these pins will just connect directly and then trigger the fire button. This also applies for pin 8, which is the common pin. They are directly connected together, so under normal conditions, they'll just work as normal and connect through to these two jacks. But when the auto fire unit is switched on, this transistor here will get activated and it will connect pin 6 directly to pin 8 via their transistor. And that will simulate the button press. And as you can see, I'm working off a very low quality picture here but I was able to work out where the components were and what components go in what position and which positions their pins should be in. So just one of my design challenges is to place it into this box here. As you can see, there's a bit of infrastructure going up and down in this direction. So what I plan to do is place the sockets on the sides here and go across through uh, on either side here so it doesn't conflict with the other wires and the other, other the switch and the variable resistor. All right, here is the completed circuit. I've connected the male and female D plugs directly to each other by pins one, two, three, and four, and underneath I have pins seven and nine connected directly to each other. They're the fire one button and the uh, second controller. And the last two pins, pin six and pin eight, I have directly connected to the board. As you can see down there, the blue, the blue cables, they go into the board and they're the ones that uh, the transistor will be controlling. Just one of the interesting issues I had with this uh, layout design was that, you probably see there, the um, resistors uh, at the top here you know, just uh, too long for the you know two holes across so they're kind of just on an angle so it's a bit of a tight design now I've got a container here that uh, that I'm going to use to house the unit I've just got some holes here to place the D plugs and at the top here uh, on the lid I've got a couple of holes that I've drilled to insert the on off switch and the speed switch. All I need to do now is insert it into the box, connect a battery to it and then connect it to the computer. I've got my auto fire in the box now and here is the connection to my Amstrad. I have at the back of the Amstrad and the joystick port the uh, just a small little adapter here to connect the box kind of wasn't designed that well on my behalf having the box because I've also got the audio cable coming out the rear then I've got the auto fire module and then connect to the auto fire module is my joystick there it is there if I turn the auto fire module on you should get the flashing LED and also modifying the speed faster and slower.
All right, I have the joystick connected. Let's test the unit out. Here's my joystick. And if I press fire, get the X. And just make sure it works. Oop, up, down, left, and right. That's all working. Okay, now I'll turn the auto fire on. And I get a series of X's. That looks really good. All right. And I'm not actually pressing the button, it's automatically doing it. Now I'm going to increase the speed. This is at the current rate of about five or six fires a second. If I increase the speed, you can see that the auto fire rate does increase. And um, I notice if I keep going faster and faster, it actually slows down. That's probably due to the keyboard refresh rate of about 50 milliseconds and the auto fire is probably firing at more than 50 milliseconds all right end of line so now it's time to play some games on this uh, auto fire unit Thanks for watching and I hope that you got something out of this video. Hopefully you can make your, your own auto fire unit and uh, we'll see you next time.